Well, good morning and welcome to the NAS at North Lakes Adult Sunday School class for November 8, 2020. This quarter we have been talking about the Ten Commandments and today is session number 10. And we will be covering that Eighth Commandment, You Shall Not Steal. The title of today's lesson is The High Cost of Theft. And the subtitle is Stealing is Not Only Sin, but also shows a distrust in God's ability and willingness to provide. Our goal this week is to discover how destructive stealing in all of its forms can be to our relationships with God and with others. Our scriptures for today is Exodus 20, 15, verse 15, and Exodus 22, 1 through 4, and Ephesians 4, 28. So, a little insight. Restitution is a principle and practice of life in the spirit of God's word required of all God followers. It is the glue, the medicine, that mends and heals fractures between members of Christ's body. The Old Testament law had much to say about this practice. And Jesus does not let Christians off the hook. So what is restitution and why is it such an important practice in the church? Making restitution is an act of restoration. It may be restoring the others. Oop, let me start again here. It may be restoring to others something I was responsible for losing. It may be the act of asking forgiveness for speaking or doing something that hurts some another or gave a false impression of their reputation or character in the community. The joy that comes from restitution, however, is missed by many because of pride that resides in their heart. Most of us have heard the Hebrew word shalom. It is based on three Hebrew root letters. And one of those is actually in our letters is S-H and L and M. And it means peace, well-being, or wholeness. Shalom is used in present-day Israel as a greeting. So when you greet somebody with Shalom, you are saying, may all be well or whole or complete with you. So in the Old Testament, the word, for trans the word that is translated restitution is from a Hebrew word based on the same three root letters. And it literally means to make whole or to make complete. Restitution is restoring the wholeness of possessions or relationships to someone whom I have caused a loss or a break. Restitution is not an option. In Exodus 22, you will find many requirements of the law are listed, and it includes a pa partial list of possible losses that one person may cause another to experience, and how those losses are to be restored. In each case, the one who has caused the loss is to restore the original loss plus a certain amount in kind of money or in kind or money as interest. John Wesley was a strong voice against the abuse and neglect of prisoners. He raised funds to ensure they had adequate clothing and blankets, and he encouraged preachers under his teaching to visit those in prison. Wesley himself spent time visiting the jails. Over a period of nine months, he preached 67 times in various jails. Wesley affirmed 
kingdom-oriented justice that sought restoration and restitution over punishment and retribution. Be a lot of raptors here, right? Okay. Connecting to experience. In the classic um, literature, Les Miserables, hunger drives a man, Jean Valjean, to steal bread. He is caught and faces legal consequences. For his crime, he must serve hard labor. Incensed by the injustice of the court, Valjean tries to escape several times, only to be caught and have his sentence extended. He is released on parole, but having been hardened and embittered by his ordeal, and with no resources, turned again to a life of crime. Finally, a generous act of mercy from a priest helps Valjean on the restor on the path of restoration and healing that lasts a lifetime. So how do we measure, measure justice? By punishment? Or by restoration? Or both? Restoration for both the victim and the perpetrator. As I think about this question, several thoughts cross my mind. Is it apparent that when we are talking about stealing, that God's intention was restitution, including value above the original loss to compensate for other issues. God's rules were the same for all. If you could not afford to make restitution, you were to be sold into slavery for up to six years to provide the cost of the restitution. On the other hand, Laws made by sinful men generally were based on punishment, and the penalty was often based on your position within the community. In our present society, we sometimes see a combination of both penalty and restitution. Okay, should punishment for crime be a one-size-fits-all? What role should mercy play in dealing with criminal behavior? The first part of this question, I wonder if the one size fit all is the same punishment for all crimes or the same punishment for all offenders of the same crime. I am sure that uh, we could agree that the same punishment for all crimes would not be reasonable. But the same punishment for all offenders of the same crime does make some sense. I do believe mercy is appropriate in some circumstances, just like God has mercy on us if we repent. In some cases, we see where the court will allow the offended party to speak during the sentencing phase of a trial. For me, this would be a place where mercy could be expressed and implemented. Does the church have a part to play in justice? Or is, it, or is this an issue best left to the state? Explain. Okay. I believe the church can play an important part in justice. In the case of of uh, prison ministries to help those sentenced to find Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and maybe work as a go-between for the repentant off of uh, the the uh, repentant offender and the victim. Church members can be involved in the election of judges and the passing of laws. Churches can also minister to victims and comfort them and help them to reach a place where they can forgive. Remember, we will be forgiven as we forgive. Now a transition thing here. In today's text, 
The people of God are called to live lives of integrity and practice kingdom of God justice. We too are invited to reject self-serving lifestyles and seek the good of others. Okay, our first scripture, Exodus twenty fifteen, you shall not steal. Now God invited people to be a holy people um, whose entire life entire lives are marked by love for God and love for others. That was God's intent. This calling extends to even how they relate to personal property. Without meaning to, we sometimes consider our stuff as unrelated to our relationship to God and others. What does the inclusion of this command communicate about the role of stuff in our holy living. Okay, sometimes, you know, the questions that are included in this lesson leave me searching my head, scratching my head, trying to understand what point they are trying to make. I think that sometimes stuff might become almost like an idol to us. I must admit, I do have a lot of stuff. I have a shop filled full of tools for woodworking and other projects. I have tried to maintain the position that the stuff I have will belong, all belongs to God. And I have made them available to people when they need them. I think some of my tools looked like orphans as they were adopted into a new family. Maybe, maybe I need to uh, tell them how they owe me two to make up for the one they adopted. Hmm, well, I'm not going there. Uh, we are not to steal other people's stuff, but we are to love one another. Now, this command ass assumes the right to personal property. However, it is a command that's couched within the context of God's repeated instructions to the care uh, of the community of the poor and the needy and the weak. If you looked in Exodus 20, chapter 23 and Leviticus chapter 19 and 23 and 25 and Deuteronomy, uh, in these verses, people were told not to glean the fields or the vineyards after harvest, but leave them for the poor. And uh, we see how God made, uh, in his laws, made uh, provision that there would be something for the poor, that they didn't have to steal to make it available to them. So, how do the commands concerning care for the poor relate to the command against stealing? We are to take care of the poor in different ways. We provide food, we're supposed to leave food in the fields for them and to harvest they were. We were to hire them as workers, uh, and etc. In doing so, we should be providing for some needs so that they were not tempted to steal. While poverty does not excuse stealing, how might a disregard for the poor contribute to the problem of theft? At the beginning of this lesson, we talked about Jean Vanjal, Valjean, who, because of poverty, felt compelled to steal bread because he could not find work and his sister's children were starving. There is um, a, sometimes it can uh, cause people to do desperate things. And sometimes the people who are poor also are uh, filled with pride and they do not want to uh, accept some kinds of help. But, you know, 
we need to make sure that we do what we can to uh, help people and uh, in a way that's loving. Okay, Exodus 22, verses 1 through 4. Whoever steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and has struck a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. But if it happens after sunrise, the defender is guilty of bloodshed. Anyone who steals must certainly make restitution. But if they have nothing, they must be sold to pay for their theft. If the stolen animal is found alive in their possession, whether ox or donkey or sheep, they must pay back double. Okay, the intention of the examples in this passage are not to establish a one-size-fits-all system of consequences, but rather to institute a pattern for practicing justice based upon the nature of the crime. So what do these examples reveal about God's heart for justice? To me, it seems that God's heart for justice includes justice that is related to the crime and seeks to make the victim whole and provide a way for the offender to be restored through making restitution. Sometimes the cost of the restitution will require getting a job or being sold as a slave. To make restitution possible, God does call for justice that restores. What is the difference between retribution and justice? That's retribution. I have a hard time pronouncing some of these words, maybe. I don't know. Retribution is punishment inflicted on someone as vengeance for a wrong or criminal act. While justice is restoration to make the the victim whole. How does this passage guide us in practicing justice instead of seeking retribution? Here we are told if a thief is caught breaking in at night and is struck a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. But if it happens after sunrise, the defender is guilty of bloodshed. So if you can identify the thief, you should seek restoration and not retribution. And when we are told everyone, anyone who steals, (coughs) excuse me, I'm going to take a little sip of water here. (sighs) Then we're told, Anyone who steals must certainly make restitution. But if they have nothing, they must be sold to pay for their theft. Now in the Hebrew system, that was like a six-year sentence. Because on the seventh year, the year of Jubilee, they were set free. Okay? Now... God takes restoration seriously. And lack of funds is not an excuse. In that other scripture, we find that if an Israelite buys another Israelite, they are not to treat them as slaves, but as a laborer. So, among the people of God, restoration for all parties took precedence over punishment for the sake of punishment. Does our society exemplify this value? Why or why not? 
Unfortunately, it would seem that our society is not a good example of this. Because we see judges deciding what jail sentences is appropriate. We see them giving consideration to the social status of the offender as well as the facts of the crime. It would appear, it would appear that punishment is a goal more than restoration. Does the church embody this kingdom value? What might that look like practically? You know, I would like to say that the church is always concerned in the restoration of a sinner to a relationship with God. However, I have seen times when a quick judgment is made that a particular sinner will never really repent. You know, even if they're seeking God, those people are sometimes made to feel unwanted by the church. The church must remember that it's made up of sinners saved by grace who are called to be witnesses to unsaved sinners and to love one another. The church is sometimes likened to a hospital where the sinners can be treated. The Christians there are the medical staff and the patients are the sinners. The medical staff in a hospital take precautions to prevent kitchen, catching the disease a patient has while they administer the medication needed for a cure. It seems to me that we need to administer the miracle drug that can cure the sinner's disease. That miracle drug is God's love as demonstrated by Jesus dying on the cross to save all who would believe in him. Our main purpose as a church, I believe, is to see the restoration of people to a relationship with God. Okay. Law exists for a reason, and breaking those laws have consequences for those who violate them. However, as an advocate for all life, how might the church be a voice for mercy, restoration, and rehabilitation? Some individuals and churches are called by God into a prison ministry, and some are called to minister to those caught up in substance abuse. When someone has paid the consequences for breaking a law, the church can reach out and help them to be restored to society, as well as, more importantly, being restored to relationship with God. When someone is a victim of crime, the church can reach out in comfort and help them to be restored as well, so that they can forgive and move on trusting in God's love and faithfulness. Okay, our next and final verse is Ephesians 4, 28. That says, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. As followers of Jesus seeking to embody the kingdom of God on earth, Paul instructed his readers to abandon their old ways of life, which was marked by theft, selfishness, and looking out for number one. What practices and habits persist in our lives as remnants of a life lived in service of self to self. It seems to me that our society 
In our society, there is the idea that we should take care of number one because no one else is going to look out for you. Because of this, we may take advantage of situations or cheat a little here and there because it does not really hurt anyone. During the recent riots, I listened to rioters that had broken into and looted businesses say it was okay because the business had insurance, so they really did not lose anything. Hmm. We need to learn to lean on God and to trust that he will supply our needs as he has promised. What practices help us develop a lifestyle that, that helps us to do something useful? Well, I'm going to take this chance to here to say PRP will be a useful and a helpful way to start and then apply what God shows you as you reach out in love to others as God has commanded. Now Paul encouraged followers of Jesus to work as they are able, not merely to provide for themselves, but to contribute to the needs of the body or those who are in need, right? We might not need to repent of thievery, but how might we need to repent of a self-oriented mindset? You know, I think we need to take a close and objective look at our lives. Are we holding back and helping brothers and sisters who are in need? And we'll say, well, I'll pray for you. Are we holding back in what we give to God? for his work or holding back in working where we need to for God. Maybe we need to ask God to show us if we are self-oriented instead of being Christ-oriented. So how can we reject culturally affirmed self-serving practices and instead embrace the other orient, others oriented lifestyle of Jesus. Well, from the hymn, from the words of an old hymn, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Or in the words of another song, have faith hope and charity that's the way to live successfully how do I know the Bible tells me so do good to your enemies and the blessed Lord you're sure to please how do I know the Bible tells me so don't worry about tomorrow just be real good today the Lord is right beside you and he'll guide you all the way. Ah. Trust in God. Follow his word. Have faith, hope, and charity, or faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of the three is love, right? Those are the three that remain, according to 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. Now to connect to life and the world. John Wesley affirmed this others-oriented posture towards our possessions and earnings by stating simply, work all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Now, immersed as we are in a culture that promotes an idolor, idol, yeah, uh, self-sufficiency and affirms 
keeping what you have for yourself, how can we practice Wesley's maxim? I believe as a Christian, we need to live by a Holy Spirit, Bible-generated Christian culture, not the world's culture. To keep from being immersed in the world's idolatrous, self-sufficiency culture, we need to put on God's life preserver. Now you may say, God's life preserver? Well, I think you can find God's life preserver described in Ephesians chapter 6, where it is called the armor of God. When you have it on, you can walk on and stay above the murky water that is the world's culture. We need to be in a Christian culture. How can we encourage one another to eject self-seeking behavior and spur one another on towards an other-oriented lifestyle? For me, the best way to spur someone on here is to be an example. We need to live a life that is not self-seeking. We need to demonstrate God's love that was freely given to you or to us um, by freely giving it others that love and that care. God saved us by grace. We did nothing to deserve it. And we need to pass that on to others. Okay, stealing does not necessarily require breaking into someone's home and taking their possessions. How do subtle, dishonest practices sometimes work their way into our lives? You know, I think we forget to praise God and to read God's word and to pray all kinds of prayers every day. We let the cares of the world make us look away from the teachings and guidance of the Holy Spirit. He's given us teachings and guidance if we'll listen, right? We forget God's promise to provide, which he will, even when we cannot see how, God will still provide for us. And we need to trust him or else we may look at our circumstances and oh, I've told people, I said, that sometimes the problem is that when we do have a problem, instead of uh, looking to God for the answer, we sometimes wonder how much uh, this is going to cost us, and we look to our own wallet, our own finances, instead of uh, looking to God and see what God would have us to do. Okay, what are some practical ways we can practice godly integrity and honesty in every facet of our lives? I think one thing we can do is remember that Jesus died for you. And then we need to grab God by the hand and don't let go. We need to clean the dirt of the world out of our ears and listen closely to the Holy Spirit. And then do what he says. Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Well, that's it for the Sunday School lesson this morning. So don't go out and steal. And make sure that uh, if you have done anything to affect somebody's reputation or something, restitution is appropriate there as well. And we can restore relationships with each other as well as relationships with God and uh, that people may come together. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we 
stop and think about your Ten Commandments and the different ones we've gone over. And we realize, Lord, sometimes uh, maybe we are more self-centered and we are concerned more of, about self. But we need to realize, Lord, that um, you're more concerned about us than we are. And you have promised to take care of us. And uh, you have been faithful to us through our lives, Lord, and during uh, many different issues and many different things. And we just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to uh, get that mindset that we look at the needs of those around us and that uh, we see how we can care for those. And uh, even though we do not have fields and farms that we can leave uh, the gleamings there for somebody to pick up in the vineyards and things, uh, we can um, be observant, Lord, and help us to discern the needs of others that uh, you would have us to touch and reach. And uh, let us, those who are seeking God, let us not be um, quick to judge. Let us... Uh, give you the opportunity to work in their lives and in the lives of those who uh, need to repent, Lord, and uh, those around us who do not know you. We just pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with each one who listens to this lesson today, that you would just be with them and give them strength and, uh, and health and watch over them in uh, these perilous times. And uh, thank you for being there with for us in all situations. Thank you for holding our hand, Lord, and just being present. We thank you. Amen. Well, okay. I hope you have a great uh, day after you listen to this or they had one before. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, you'd be with them. And I want you to know that God loves you, and so do I. Have a great day. Goodbye.